Okay, second video about Mr. Death. Um, so, I guess what I'm getting at with regard to what I was just saying about Fred Leuchter, which was the way he talks about human beings, um, I'm not saying this is as much information, perhaps, as we would like to have to make our decision about him. But what we have to go on for our purposes for writing this paper, but also, you know, for us to, to develop our impression of this individual that we're going to write about is, is what's in the film. I don't really want you to do additional research. Maybe after you write the paper, you can do that to your heart's content, but I don't really want to complicate the assignment by having you do, do a bunch of um, additional research. Um, but what I would say is, I think, I think much as there might be additional things you'd want to know, I would say there's sort of the more logical and the less logical explanation. And I just kind of made a case for why I'm saying I'm not really persuaded by the idea that um, Leuchter got into this for humanitarian reasons. I would add to that also the fact that it's important to know that when Errol Morris made this film, Leuchter was being talked about in the public forum and and he was being criticized for the claims he made about the Holocaust. So he knows when he has this film and, and people that haven't heard about this are going to be hearing about it for the first time. He knows one of the first things they're going to hear about him is that he build, builds electric, uh, 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 execution equipment. And so it also seems potentially logical to me that he's trying to diffuse the potential negative viewpoint somebody might have. And if he plants the idea that he got into this for humanitarian reasons, maybe he's going to come across a little better. But I, I have doubts about um, the veracity of that. And I think part of it is if you consider over the course of the film the actions he takes, there's nothing to me that exemplifies him being somebody that's particularly concerned with others um, that would make him some sort of model humanitarian. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is a particular scene in the film that you might have encountered. Now, in the first third of the film that we encounter, that is about sort of his, his personal life and profession, um, he tells a story about how he, um, and this, I think the scene that describes this, if you want to scrutinize it, I think it be begins in the video that you watched about 12 minutes in. He tells a story about repairing this particular electric chair. And the, and what I'm about to talk about is, is related to, I think, question number six on your sheet of questions. And he, he, he my question is basically, he took this photograph for engineering purposes as he's working on this chair. And he suggests that his photo may have captured, he says, an aura or an entity, which to cut to the chase, I think, you know, um, means like a ghost. And he suggests in a way that maybe, um, you know, somebody who was electrocuted in the chair when he split open the chair because he needed to widen it and add a panel of wood to make it a wider, larger chair. Maybe it released a spirit. Um, it's an odd thing, you know, that he's asserting there. Um, and maybe, maybe it went by when you watched it and you went, huh, I'm not really sure what the significance of that is. But Errol Morris did put this in the movie for a reason. And so I guess I want to talk about it for a second here and say, one, um, I don't think this bears directly upon the claims that Leuchter makes about the Holocaust, which, are, which is really what this movie at the end of the day is about, is about the, the claims Leuchter makes about the Holocaust and the question of why he makes these claims. Um, but... What I will say is, um, I do want to talk about some technology relative to photographs, okay? I'm filming this video right now on my iPhone. Uh, we didn't have those when I was growing up. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the event that we're now describing of him taking this photograph, according to the film, occurs in about 1989. In 1989, if you took a photograph, you used a camera that had a roll of film in it. When you used up the roll of film, you would drive down to have it developed, you know, at a photo development place. Uh, you know, at some point they developed the one hour photo technology, but before that you used to have to wait maybe a week to get your photos developed uh, in very different times. I remember those times, okay? Um, what I would say is, I'm going to try to say this as like concisely as possible, but basically there was a phenomenon called a double exposure. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but... You see it sometimes in advertisements of they'll have an image that's maybe of, it'll be an image of a man looking up like this, and then inside his head you'll see the image of a snowy mountain peak. And maybe it's by putting the image of the mountain in the man's head, you're suggesting that he's looking up because he's dreaming of climbing a mountain or something like that. Maybe it's an ad for hiking boots or down jackets or something like that. Well, now, of course, they do that all on computers to make that image. But back in the early days of photography and or, or you know, um, you used to have to actually develop photos by, by shining light through the negative of, of the film, like the, the developed piece of film that had come directly from the camera. And then it would the image would be cast on a piece of photographic paper, which you'd then have to run through a series of chemicals that would bring the image up and then lock it into place and then, you know, etc. But what would sometimes happen is if two negatives were put on top of each other, you would get this compound image. And, um, you know, sometimes this happened by mistake in the early years of photography and then and then some photographers who were artists went, how can we exploit this mistake for artistic purposes? And they would make experimental, strange photographs with, you know, superimposed images. And, and you know, people in films did this too. And this is how the sort of history of film developed and all that stuff. But what I would say is in the 80s, if you took your film to get developed, it was a very common thing that there were mistakes sometimes made. And I have memories of getting my pictures back and there would be double exposures. And so you might have an image of your grandmother sitting on a couch in one picture and you took another picture of your dog leaping for a frisbee. But when you get your photos back, there's just one picture and it's a picture of your dog leaping through your grandmother. And it looks like a sort of ghost dog and a ghost grandmother or something like that. Now, I say that to say... When I was a child, I knew. I mean, you know, I don't know exactly what age, but when I was a child, I knew about double exposures. I knew they were a thing. I knew they happened fairly often. And I knew that they didn't mean that some sort of metaphysical event had happened, that a ghost had appeared or something like that. Fred Leuchter, when he gets this image of the face on the electric chair, and you can look in the film, I think it's at about 15 minutes into the film, that you actually see this sort of red electric chair with the face there. And maybe it's blurry, um, given that, it's on, that you're watching the movie on YouTube. But I would just say the most rational explanation for why that entity or aura appeared in that film would be a double exposure because they happened all the time. Um, Leuchter seems to gloss right over that as a possibility and go directly to the assumption that he caught an image of a ghost. Um, so my question then becomes, and by the way, let me add this. In the actual image that's in the film, I actually even know whose face that is, which is, it's Marlon Brando. It's an image from the film Apocalypse Now, which actually this poster on the wall behind me is, contains an image of Marlon Brando's face from that movie. Um, all of that is to say it's, it's, it's not, um, 
an image of a ghost. Um, this is lost on Fred Leuchter for some reason, and his mind jumps to a fairly fantastical explanation. Um, I think Arnold Morris includes this in the film to show us something about the way Fred Leuchter's mind works. Um, I could say more, but I'll leave it there, but I have a feeling you can perhaps see how, even though it is not directly about the Holocaust, how it might show us something about how Leuchter's mind works and what may have happened in his supposed investigation into what happened in the Holocaust, okay? Um, so, I, there's more stuff I'd like to talk about. I'm running out of time. I guess what I would say is questions 8 and 10 are interesting. They're also about the question of how logically Fred Leuchter thinks. I will just say... Question eight basically talks about the fact that Fred Leuchter um, at one point is able to make this distinction when he says he, he, he had experience building electric chairs, but another state hired him to build a lethal injection, injection machine. And he says, it was not logical to assume that because I could build an electric chair, I could build a lethal injection machine. He says they don't operate on the same principles at all. One is electronics, like wiring and you know, electrical currents, and the other has to do with, you know, injecting stuff into somebody's system and all that. And he says, well, they, they just happen to both be under the heading of execution equipment. So he seems to be able to make this kind of logical distinction there. But then in question 10, he says, because of my experience in the construction of execution equipment, I was asked to testify by Zundel, um, and, and basically what he's saying is I was deemed an expert in determining whether or not the Holocaust happened or the gas chambers existed. And he's granting that he was that expert. And he's, you know, he says in the film that he was the, the one to be able to do that job. And so in a way between questions 8 and 10, what I'm asking is, what happened to his ability to make a rational distinction? Because he makes it in the first case. You know, I was qualified to build electric chairs, not really qualified to do a lethal injection machine, but they deemed me as if I'm an expert on one, I am in the other, and he's going, that wasn't logical. But in the second one, he's going, because I built execution equipment, I was made to be the expert to figure out whether the Holocaust happened. And he seems to say, and, and they were right, I was the expert. He's lost the ability to make that decision, d distinction. And I'm in a way asking, what's changed? Why has that ability for him to make that distinction gone away? That's something I want you to think about. Um, and the way to think about it is, in the latter, is there a motivation that makes it go away? What does he get? What's the payoff for losing his ability to make the distinction. That would be another way of putting it. Okay, so I want to uh, leave you with this thought for now. Um, when you go back and watch the film a second time, which you will need to do to write this paper, okay? Be especially looking out for what we are, uh, what is said by two people in particular. Um, one is the chemist, James Roth. He's the one who processed the samples, you know, the sort of rock samples in little sandwich bags that Fred Leuchter brings back from um, Poland, from the concentration camps. Um, the other is the historian, Van Pelt. He's the one who talks about visiting the archives He's the one who's talking often when we see the videos of Fred Leuchter chipping things out of the walls illegally, by the way, at Auschwitz or at the concentration camps. And he's, they're both critical of Leuchter. Now, it doesn't mean they're, it's a personal attack critical. It means they're using their logical, critical faculties to question the claims Leuchter is making by presenting logical arguments. They have different arguments because they're addressing slightly different matters. 
But what they have to say is very important, and I'll end by saying, and they're both actually legitimate experts in their fields, have PhDs in their fields, um, and so on. So I would just say on a subsequent viewing, pay close attention to what they have to say. I'm going to leave it there for now. Thank you.